Well, it's that time of the week again. It's time for Chit Chat Across the Pond. This is episode number 794 for May 25th, 2024. And I'm your host, Allison Sheridan. This week, our guest is Bart Bouchotts, back with Programming by Stealth 166 of X. We're closing in on the end game on JQ, aren't we, Bart? We really are, depending on how you count it. I think I make a joke in the in the final sort of final thoughts section that if this was a book, we're actually arriving at the bit that says the end. But like the Lord of the Rings, there's another bit that says uh, epilogue, which will be next time. <laughs> but really, this t- we're really rounding it out today. This this is the end of the mainstream things I think most people will need. And then the next episode is things I know some people will need. No one's going to need it all. And I don't, everyone's going to need different bits. So I, I'm sort of thinking of it like a tasting menu where you get like 12 <laughs> courses and we don't go into any of them in too much detail. But you'll like some of them. <laughs> I don't know which ones. <laughs> all right. Well, that sounds fun. So basically the bit I've been leaving to the end is the bit where you shorten your code in such a way that it becomes more dense and therefore it would be really hard to explain early in the series. But when you know what it's compressing, you won't have a problem with it. And you'll in fact greatly appreciate the fact that we're compressing our code. And so you'll end up being able to write the same logic easier. And I've front loaded the most difficult concept at the start of the show notes, because there's one of these that is, well, when the penny drops, you'll be fine. But it's one of those pennies that may get a bit stuck because it's, it's obvious in the same way Linux is obvious, in hindsight. <laughs> okay. So, anyway, basically, we have been exploding arrays all the time, right? That has been, at this stage, First it's almost become a joke where I say, right, you explode the array and you catch the pieces by putting it inside square brackets. You explode the array and we catch the pieces. Or we start off with a, with a dictionary, we turn it into entries, we mess with it, and we then turn it back into a dictionary. So from entries, two entries, from entries, two entries, from entries, two entries, right? That, that's sort of been what we've been doing for the last quite a few installments. And we don't need to do that. We can actually operate on the array without taking it apart. We can manipulate it in one piece, and we can manipulate the content of dictionaries while they're still assembled. So we can just do one piece and say, yeah, I want this change. Just do it to everything. Um, But we will start with a function that is designed to, the word I use is digest. Basically give you an answer based on every element in the array. And it'll be one answer. So take the array and turn it into a single thing. And there's a function for doing that in one step as well. That one's kind of hard to explain in the abstract. So I have lots of examples there. So hopefully that will uh, help with that one. But of course, I set you a challenge at the end of the previous installment. So we are still having a lot of fun with our Have I Been Pwned data set. Early in the series, I was very much enjoying my Nobel Prizes. But at this stage, I think I know everyone who's ever won. Um, (laughs) And I, I got a bit tired of that data set. Whereas with my real life hat on, I have unfortunately needed to become very familiar with the Have I Been Pwned data set. Because these data breaches, they won't stop. They just, they keep Mm. happening. Annoying things. So actually needing to figure this stuff out is a genuine problem for me. So I've been solving it anyway. So why not share? So with that in mind, um, we had a JQ function for searching an export from a breached domain to look for every one of our users who was caught up in the breach du jour. And that search was a little naive and it was intentionally a little naive because I didn't want to put too much on people at once. Um, So the challenge was then to make it less naive. And instead of simply telling us which person had a match, tell us some useful information about those matches. So what actual person was in what breach with what title and what was in the breach? What was the breached data? So instead of just getting back when you search for a link, just getting back, you know, Bob, Alice and John, but, you know, okay, well, there's probably 10 breaches that match the word link. So which one, two, three or four of those was Bob involved in and which ones were Alice involved in and which ones were Tom involved in, right? So this time we're actually going to know who, what and where, which user, what was breached, where it was breached. So that's that's the aim of the exercise here. And for bonus credit, the 
final piece was to not only search on the name of the breach, because the name is actually, it's sort of a unique ID. It's what is under the hood uniquely identifies it, but there, there are never any special characters in the name. They never have spaces, they never have dots, they never have accented characters. But when you look on the website, they do have dots and spaces and accented characters and stuff. And so sometimes if you start on the website and try to paste it into the breach report, it doesn't match. I had I had this problem for real with a recent breach, which had a period in it. And I was like, what? I, oh, that's you, mean. You sent me an email saying 20 of our people were involved in this. And now when I search, it finds zero. What? <laughs> But it was because the title had the period, but the name didn't. So the bonus extra is to search both the name and the title. And if either match, we're happy. So basically, we need to add in an or clause for our bonus credit. And of course, we got to practice our data enrichment. So just to remind everyone that when you sign up for domain notifications, you get to download the JSON file that literally just puts, it's a lookup table of the username part of email addresses mapping to an array of strings, and those strings are just the names of the breaches. So it doesn't tell you anything about the breach, it just says, you know, Bob, start an array, LinkedIn, Dropbox, whatever, right? Close the array, and nothing more. But you can download, even without signing up, there's actually some of the API endpoints are free, and one of the free endpoints is, tell me about all the breaches you know. And you get a giant big JSON file, which goes into great detail for every one of those breaches. And it's a dictionary indexed by that same name that's in those arrays. And it tells you what date the breach was on and how many people were caught up in the breach and what was breached and lots and lots of information about each breach. And so we want to use that JSON file to enrich the results in our domain breach file so that we get a richer answer which we do with the minus minus slurp file com- uh, command line flag we learned about two installments ago, I think, the stage 164, I think. Yes. At least. So, yeah. Yeah. So that is, that is our, our challenge. And so as per my wonderfully boring naming convention, you will find the sample solution as pbs165-challenge-solution-basic.jq in the installment zip file. Uh, and... For the most part, it's extremely similar to the to the uh, challenge solution to the previous time, which is, I did actually say, you know, you use that as a starting point. Um, and before we look at the how it works, I want to show that it works, but also just to remind us the shape of the data we're working with. So the export, as I said, is a dictionary named breaches, where, which is a lookup table linking email address usernames to arrays of breach names. And so I'm going to be really focusing on this poor E. Green person who was caught up in the Dropbox <laughs> breach and this M. W. Kelly person who was caught up in Dropbox, LinkedIn, the LinkedIn scrape, PDL and something called KOMU, which I find hilarious to say, even though I've no idea what it is. Um, I also find it funny that you don't call it KOMO since it's M-O-E. That's a very fair point, but KO Moo just sounds way better. It's so, funnier. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, and then also just that big data dump. It contains, you know, name, title, and data classes is what we really care about, which is an array of what was breached. So for Dropbox, that was email addresses and passwords. So if we run our challenge solution... And we say, you know, minus minus slurp file, the big list of breaches. We say minus minus args, what we're going to search for. And if we search for LinkedIn, we get back one answer that MW Kelly was caught in LinkedIn, which contained email addresses and passwords. Okay. Now, if we look up, MW Kelly was in LinkedIn and LinkedIn scrape. So why did we only get one answer back? It's because LinkedIn scrape did not contain passwords and we were only interested in breaches with passwords. So the script is working as we had hoped. So let's run it again. And this time let's do a way more generic search. Let's look for any breach with the letter O. And you might think that would return. Yeah, only on our data set, it only returns two. It returns MW Kelly. Tw- well, okay, sorry, it only returns two I'm going to tell you about. I did truncate the output, actually. Uh, MW Kelly was caught up in Dropbox and KO Mo, as we're going to properly call it this time. Oh, now I wrecked it. You were all happy. <laughs> yes. Um, 
And what was I going to say about it? Uh, so we found KO Mo by searching for the letter O. But if I had actually searched for what it looked like on the website, ko.moe, we would not have found it, which is where the bonus solution comes in. And that we'll find it later. Okay. So now that we've seen that it works, how does it work? What do I want to draw your attention to? Well, really, the interesting part of the solution is what we do as we filter those entries in the breaches lookup table down to just the ones we're interested in. So that's the bit I'm going to focus on in the snippets of code. And so the first thing we do is we explode that list of entries. So we're going to have our list of entries. And because we're going to go ahead and explode all of the breaches for that person, we need to keep track of who it is whose breaches we're about to explode. So the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to save the account name. Now, we have converted breaches into a list of entries, which means that the key is now the username and the value is now the list of breaches. So if we want to save the username, we say dot key as dollar account name. So that's us saving the account name in a variable called dollar account name. And the reason we didn't do that before was we, we weren't going through the entire list of all the breaches. Well, if we did, we were never able to connect it back to a person because we hadn't learned about variables. Right, but the end of the last one, we ended up with uh, .key was what we piped out, which gave us the names. But only the name, and it didn't tie the name to a specific okay. breach. So its connection back to the breach was lost. Got you. Okay. Yeah, or we didn't even try. We never exploded the list of breaches to give us more information. We just went, yeah, this person was involved in one of those breaches we mentioned. Therefore, we'll tell you about this person. But now we're going to go deeper. I'm going to explode right into the individual breaches. And so we need to take with us that username. So then, I, then as I uh, you know, signaled, we're going to explode that list of breaches. So dot value, open square bracket, close square bracket. So now that we've exploded the list of breaches, the thing in dot is the name of a breach. So Dropbox, ko.mu, whatever. Oh, because right? it's the value at that point. Yes, because it's the okay. value was an array. We've now exploded the array. So what's left now in dot is individual breach names. So we now need to do our searching. So we can easily search against the name of the breach, which is sitting in dot, by simply saying ASCII down case pipe that to contains our search string piped to ASCII down case. So the input to ASCII down case is dot. We pipe that to contains, which is now the lowercase version of the breach name. Check that against our search, which we're also passing to ASCII down case. So that's checking the name. Right. That doesn't tell us whether or not there was a password. So now we need to do the data enrichment dance to figure out whether or not the breach that we've just found contains passwords. So we say and, and then our breach details is the file we slurped in, and it always wraps everything you slurp in in an array, even if that's an array of length one. So that's why it's breach details, open square bracket, zero, close square bracket. So that's just getting us into the data structure. Okay. Now inside that data structure, it's a lookup table indexed by the name of the breach. The name of the breach is sitting in dot. So to dive into the right entry in that giant big lookup table, we say open square bracket dot close square bracket to go into Dropbox or LinkedIn or whatever the current breaches we're processing. Right. And what we care about is the data classes. So we've gone and grabbed the relevant data classes for our breach. We pipe that to contains and we're looking for passwords. So if that comes out as true, there were passwords and the name has already matched and we've said and, so that will select when both of those things are true. And what's finally been piped through is still going to be the ASCII down case result of the search string to the name? Yes. Okay. Well, it's not going to be down cased. It's going to be whatever came in because select returns whatever it got unchanged. So we've down cased it to do as comparison, but oh, select spits oh, it out okay. unchanged. Right, select never changes anything. Ah. Select is a everything or nothing, everything or nothing. 
So it comes back out exactly how it came okay, in. Okay, so that's just, it's just doing the matches, but now that it's got it, now it goes back and says the thing that it started with. Okay. Yes, precisely. So it's a filter, right? It's filtering out everything that doesn't meet the criteria. So what that ends up doing is giving us our nice, we now have sitting just the name of a breach, just Dropbox. And we still have the name of the person in the variable. So to build our output, we just use a dictionary construction, open a curly bracket, account name, colon, dollar account name, because we saved it in a variable. Yay. Breach name. Well, that's still sitting in dot. So breach name, colon, dot. Another easy one. The breach title and the breached classes, we have to do the data enrichment dance again. So it's exactly the same. Breach details, open square bracket, zero, close square bracket. Dive into the appropriate breach, open square bracket, dot, close square bracket. Pull out the title and then pull out the data classes. And that's it. Okay. That's, it's so clean when you do it, Bart. <laughs> Build it up slowly and spend hours at it. And then write some short code that looks elegant. It's the spend yeah, hours at it. I had a little trouble figuring out how to, how to start uh, how to start small with it. So, but I see what you did. Yeah. So for the bonus challenge, then it was just to search on the title as well as the name. And the reason is for stuff like KO Mo, where if you just search for KO.mo, like it shows up on the website, it won't be found until you use a bonus solution, then it will be found. Now, there's actually very, very little needed to turn the basic solution into the bonus solution. It's literally adding in an or statement. Now, lots of brackets, because we need to check the name or the title, and all of that gets put into brackets, and it contains passwords. So that's so that what is so the much nesting. Not finding, that was the problem with it, not finding that, that one uh, breach that he was in was because it had, uh, the, the name had the, what, I forget, it had a dot in period. it. But yeah. the, a period, but the, but the title did not. So had you searched both, you would have found it? Precisely. Precisely. Okay. And so literally it is just a matter of, uh, just a matter of adding in an or, but because we're grouping it together with an and, we have to put brackets around it all. So it looks a lot longer, but it really is just open an extra bracket, add in the or clause and close the bracket. So what's in the show notes is the basic solution followed by the bonus solution. And you'll see that the difference is, or we do it on the title as well. Okay. Right. Cool. So that is, that is our penultimate challenge. That's our second last challenge. There is one more. At the end of this installment, okay. but then, then we are done. So let us move on to the concept of manipulating without exploding. And we're going to look at three very useful features. So first off, we're going to start with the one that's the most mentally exercising, which is an operator. We haven't had a new operator in a while. So not a, not a simple function, a whole operator. So there's a lot more detail on an operator. And the word I'm going to use to describe what it does is we distill an entire array into a single value based on some sort of piece of logic. And so an example of distilling would be the length function, which distills an array to a number, its length. The add function, which adds every element in an array together, distills the array to a single number, the sum of all of its elements. Right, that's what I mean by distill. Is you take an input of many okay. values and you get an output of one. So, like with okay. the still, lots of stuff goes in, alcohol comes out. But <laughs> it can't be five things turn into two. No, and you're, it's the always way you're using one. the word. It's into one. Okay, it's always into one. So it's an array into a value, array to value, okay. array to value, which is actually something you end up doing quite a lot when you look at it more deeply. So we're going to start there with that whole new keyword, reduce. So the keyword is reduce. Right, we take an array and we reduce it to a single value. And then we're going to look at applying one piece of logic to every element in an array all at once. And the function for that is called map, because you map an operation to every element in an array. So it's quite a common name for this functionality is map. And you might notice map reduce is actually the two functions that are used to implement stuff like Google. And a lot of statistics are implemented based on map reduce. So it's a very common paradigm. It doesn't make sense to me because it's statistics, but I always hear people talk about map reduce, map reduce, map reduce, and JQ can do it. Hmm. And then the last thing we're going to look at is applying one piece of logic to every value in a dictionary. So a dictionary is key value pairs. The map values function 
as its name suggests, doesn't touch the keys. But it goes into every key and updates the matching value. So map does okay. everything in an array and map values does the values in a dictionary. Okay, you're using two different words. Uh, let me just make sure I understand mm -hmm. why in the in the text versus your your verbal explanation. Your text says applying the same edit to every element in an array is map. Uh, and you said the same function. So you, a function would be something that edited that... The yeah, key. the same operation, the same change. Make the same change, change. to everything okay. in an array. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And the whole point so is change. Map again, map again is only to the key, and map values is only to the value. No, map is to an array, so an array only has values. Gotcha. Okay. Oh, oh, there's the difference. Okay, one was in an array, one was in a dictionary. Okay, there good. We go. Got it. Okay, so we're going to start with the heavy lifting one last time for JQ. So we're going to look at the reduce operator. And the reduce operator is so powerful. I can't remember if it was in a blog post or in the actual documentation. But the author basically said the reason reduce exists is because it's how a lot of built-in functions are created. And I was in two minds as to whether or not to even make it a public function. But it's so useful I made it public anyway, even though most of the time you're going to use reduce in disguise. Because in fact, hmm. every time you've used the length function, you have been using reduce. It's just, it's been wrapped for you and tied up in a little bow because that's how it's actually done. So reduce is like the brains behind stuff we've already been using. Okay. But there are brains we can play with too. So we can make up our own extra functions that hmm. apply the same kind of a thing to arrays. So because it's an operator, the syntax is a lot more than just reduce open round bracket, right? There's, it's, it's a full operator. So... The syntax is the keyword reduce, then a filter, which we're going to call the generator expression. You'll see why when we describe it. So reduce some filter as some variable name, open around bracket, one filter, semicolon, another filter. So reduce filter as variable, round bracket, filter, semicolon, filter, close the round bracket. That's a lot of moving pieces. Yeah, okay. right? That's right. four pieces I need to describe to you. Okay. So the reduce function starts by saying, give me multiple values. So the generator expression is there to make many values and nine times out of 10, you explode an array. So you say reduce, oh, okay. name of array, open square bracket, close square bracket. But in theory, you could reduce anything that outputs something. So it, basically it's saying reduce this thing, but this thing has to be generated. So you yes. need a generator expression in order to create the thing that's going to get reduced. Bing, bing, bing. E.g. Uh, explode an array. Explode an array. Exactly. Okay, I got one down. <laughs> so <laughs> see if you can keep then it says it. as, and then we have to name a variable. And the okay. name we give this variable is going to be each individual piece, because this is going to be a loop. Right? We're going to loop through all of the things we've generated, and so we need to give a name to the current piece. So we get to make that name. So that's what we put there. We make up the name. Okay. And then inside the roundy brackets come the two pieces of logic to do the work. So this is like an accumulator. We're going to build up an answer. We're going to start with an initial value, do the same thing once for everything in our list, and then the final value is what gets returned. So we start with something, we, we update it, update it, update it, and the final update is the answer. A single value? A single value. So it's, mm. I, I call it an accumulator, right? Think of it like the yeah, one memory in your calculator. When an accumulator is a variable that starts with one value, is updated, and then it's finished. So you start with okay. a value, you update it, and then that's what you output. Okay. So it's like a bucket, right? We start off with a bucket and you get to put something in the bucket as a starting point. And then every time through the loop, you get to change the bucket and whatever's in the bucket at the end, that's your answer. It's one bucket okay. all the way through and you get to manipulate it at every step. Okay, I'm going to do something I don't normally do in the show, but all of a sudden your volume went way down. Whoa. Not, not, not terrible, but just went down about, I don't know, 10 or 15%. Indeed. 
literally whack my microphone, so I probably yeah, that was actually it. moved it. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, there you know, she you is. Your microphone and it moves by an inch. <laughs> it's funny when you go, when you go like this, it gets harder to hear, and then you come back and it's easier to hear. <laughs> yeah, it's funny then. Yeah, there we go. Okay, right, good. Okay. Thank you, Alison. And it's not a dodgy cable. I physically <laughs> knocked my microphone out of my face. <laughs> We were so okay. excited about, about accumulators. It kind of was, yeah. So Okay, so I'm hoping this is going to make more sense when we get to see an example. Like oh, that. yeah, right. So okay. the first one is the starting value for your accumulator, and the second one is how do I change it? What do I do every time? So to show how this works, we're going to redo a few basic JQ functions that really do exist. So the first one, we're going to redo length. We're just going to make our own version of length. So we're okay. going to say reduce dot open square bracket close square bracket so whatever array you send to me i'm going to explode it that's how i'm going to get my pieces i'm going to say as dollar item i'm never going to use dollar item because i haven't i don't care what's in the array i just care about how many but i have to give it a name so sure item whatever dollar i whatever right i name it because i have to i start counting at zero so my initial expression is just zero my bucket starts at zero. For every item in the array, I take the current value of my bucket and I add one. Okay. And you do that so, by saying? Dot plus one. So current value of the accumulator plus one. Um, so if I what if pass... The value, what if the value in the array was telephone? The string okay. telephone. Right. The telephone would be in dollar item. Yes. I'm not touching dollar item. I am saying the current value of the accumulator plus one. I know, but I don't know what... Okay, let's do I'm... it with the array 246. It could be the array pancake waffles well, Do it now, with right? not numbers for me. Okay, we'll pretend telephone it says pancake waffles. No. <laughs> horse battery staple. There we horse go. battery staple. Great. Oh, horse battery staple. Three. Okay, perfect. So... The first time through the loop, oh, sorry, the very first thing it says, reduce our array horse battery staple by exploding it. So we're going okay. to have three exploded pieces here. Mm -hmm. We're going to name each exploded piece dollar item, and we're never going to use that name ever again. The first time so through the, the loop. The first time through is horse, dollar item is horse. Yes. Okay, but we don't care. We don't care. So before okay. we go through at all, we start our accumulator with zero. So... We have horse battery staple waiting, and our accumulator is zero. So that's okay. the four pieces. We are handed horse. We don't ever look at horse. We say, what is the current value of the accumulator? It is zero, plus one. The accumulator is now one. We throw away the horse. Two, So wait a minute, battery. wait a minute, wait a minute. How did it know that it was zero if we haven't gone through this once first? I would think horse okay. would have been zero. Right, right, no, so... That's why we have to, one expression, semicolon, another. The first expression is the initializer. So with a for loop, you would say i equals zero, which happens before the first loop, right? This is like that. Okay. So it but starts at zero. zero the first time through. And you're saying it's, it's zero, already no, no. one our first no, no, time it's through. No, it's zero after. before the horse arrives. Before the horse arrives, it is already zero. <laughs> then the okay, horse the arrives. The horse is still in the barn. Okay. So it right. is zero. And now we look at the first thing in the array, which is horse. And so we say zero plus okay. one. So the accumulator is one and the horse is finished. Then we get okay. to battery. The accumulator is already one. We say one plus one. The accumulator is now two and we throw away the battery. Then the staple arrives. The accumulator is two. We say dot plus one. So the accumulator is now three. We throw away the battery. There are no more pieces. Three is the output. Huh. Okay. So that is length. It is literally reduce dot x open, open square bracket, close square bracket as whatever zero semicolon dot plus one. Hmm. So let's implement the add function, which adds all of the numbers in an array together. It's also a standard JQ function. So the syntax is going to be similar. We say reduce dot open square bracket, close square bracket. So we're going to be handed an array, explode it. As dollar item, this time we care. We're adding up the elements in the array, so we definitely do need to know what each element is called. So we actually care that we call it item, dollar item. We say start the accumulator at zero. Before we have added any numbers, 
There is nothing. If you give me an empty array, I will output zero. The update operator is the current value plus dollar item. So this time we're not sending horses, batteries, or staples. This time we're sending 246. Okay. So we start with the array 246. We explode it into pieces. Before we process the two, we start our accumulator at zero. Then we meet the two. So we have zero plus dollar item, which is two. So now the accumulator is at two. We throw away the two. Next we meet four. So we have four, sorry, two plus four is six. Throw away the four. We already have six plus the new six gives us 12. We throw away the six. There are no more things. 12 is the output. I wish everybody could see the, the, as Bart Look was trying to do the math in his head of, <laughs> of six by when he got to six, he was like, okay, wait a minute. That's a different six. And that's a guy. So I'm like, look up, you know how you look up when you're trying to add. <laughs> yes. I knew it was going to be tricky. Right. But do you see what's happening? We, we have yeah. one, yeah. we have one variable and we're updating it every time using the logic we add. So whatever we had yeah. now, add it. Whatever we had now, add it. There is no built-in multiply function. But we can make one. Uh, we can say reduce dot open square bracket close square bracket as dollar item one semicolon dot star dollar item. Now I chose one because if you multiply by zero, it doesn't get you very far. I figure yeah, one was yeah. probably a better starting point. So if we send I don't in think you two, need to four, do the math six, force on that. No, I'm not going to. It's 48. Sense. <laughs> You can copy and paste the JQ command into your terminal and then we'll tell you it's 48. But we can, of course, do way cooler things than just adding it up. The factorial function is a very good thing to do with reduce because it's a very repetitive thing that you, you build up. So the factorial of a number is one time, it's every number up to that number multiplied together. So the factorial of three is one times two times three which is six. The factorial That's backwards, of Bart. It's three times two times one. <laughs> I've never which thought is of it identical. as one times. I know, but I've never thought of it that way. As you start with the number you want, you multiply it by the number lower than that, lower than that, lower until you get to one. You don't start at one. Nobody does that. <laughs> well, I do because it's easier programming. <laughs> it's mathematically identical. <laughs> You're right. The textbook says it the other way around. The factorial of four is four, three, two, one, or one, two, three, four. One times two times three times four. Okay. We can implement that by reusing the range function we met in the previous installment for doing oh. our multiplication tables. Because we don't have to explode an array. We can do anything we want inside that reduce to make some values. Now, the range function is programmer type. The first argument is the starting value. The second argument is one more than where it actually stops. So if you want to go to three, you actually have to say one semicolon four. So that means that we want the range from one to dot plus one, which is so okay, annoying. We're, so we're, if the number four is coming in, yeah, you're saying it's going to go from one to five. Well, we say no. five as the second argument, but range will never give us the five because range always stops one short. So range will give us one to four, but we say one to four by saying one to dot plus one because range That's is a... annoying. Okay. So anyway, range, our range of numbers as dollar i, because I got tired of typing item, one, because <laughs> we're doing multiplication, semicolon dot star dollar i. Okay. That will do it, right? That takes one times two times three times four, and on it goes. Which means I can tell you, without doing all the math in my head, that the factorial of five is 120. And factorial Very goes good. up very fast, because six times 120 is 600, uh, 720 ish. It's got to be a, it's kind of a four in it somewhere, doesn't it? 740 then? <laughs> Well, yeah, I can it open does. the terminal right. and find out. You could really, couldn't you? Yeah, anyway, I think it's 740, I think. My second answer, not my first answer. <laughs> oh, the blind leading the blind so on this one. So wait a minute. So you gave it as the input, you gave it you gave it five. Right, which is the factorial of five is 120. I thought we were doing four. We're doing whatever, right? It's whatever we pass in is gonna be dot. 
So you change that five to a six, then dot will be six. Yeah, but the example you gave was one to four, wasn't it? That was before, that was in the lead up, like the factorial of three is, the factorial of four is. But in the code, jq minus n, five, pi, produce, I did it with five. That was a bigger number. I hadn't okay. told you the answer to that but, one. It, but the text right above it says range one co- uh, semicolon four would, re- 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 uh, would, would produce, produce, one, produce two, one, two, three. Right. Yes. Yeah, so that's me just describing how weird the range operator is. I didn't want to give too long of an example there. Okay. It is 720, you're right. Um, I shouldn't have changed my mind. (laughs) Okay, so that is reduce, which is simple, elegant, and makes your brain hurt. Very (laughs) Linuxy. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so that's the heavy lifting in there too. Really made it fun. True. So that's the heavy lifting. Now we get to coast out on two easier functions. Let's start with map. We are going to process an entire array in one go with map. Map is a function. So as a function, it's just map open bracket. And in this case, it always has exactly one argument, which is the filter we would like to apply to every element in the array. And inside that filter that we pass as the first argument, dot represents the current value of the array. That's all there is to it. Map open bracket, what you'd like to do, close bracket. That's it. So as a simple example, let us take an array of numbers and convert them all to their absolute value. And so we do that by saying map abs. Abs is the function for absolute value. So we just say apply abs to all of our input. So if we give that the array 1, minus 2, 3, minus 42, we get back 1, 2, 3, 42. I'll hold on. Hold, please. While I scroll yes. back and read what we said at the beginning. So I thought these were... Okay, so map does is not like reduce. It doesn't go down right. to one thing. That's right. what I was yeah. looking for. So okay. reduce distills our array, map transforms our array, and map value transforms our dictionary. But it actually keeps the same dictionary. number of things. Yes, because we're it's okay. like a loop. We're basically doing a whole loop in one go. So yeah. effectively, we're mapping the function abs to every entry in the array. Yeah, I like it. And it really is just that simple. Map abs. That's it. Um, we can also really simplify our filtering of things by mapping to select. If you Google for things, you will see map select all over the place. Because it lets us shrink an array down without exploding it. So instead of exploding it, putting all the pieces through select, we just apply the select straight to the whole array because select either outputs absolute nothingness, it outputs the empty value, not null, or it outputs the original value, which means that everything that fails the select disappears from the array. So when you map select, it literally wipes it out of existence if it doesn't match the filter. So you start so off that, with that a, actually changes what I just just finished saying, which is map always comes up with the same number of things. No, if you've got got four things and one of them isn't a match, after you go through map select, there'd only be three. Yeah, it's the out, yeah. every input is processed once, but if the result of processing that input is that the input goes away, well, then it's gone. <laughs> yeah, you've just destroyed it. But that's really quick. It gives nice short code for just shrinking an array down to meet some sort of a criteria. So, so you can do a map select on your previous array, your one, negative two, three, negative 42, and say, only give me the positive values, and you would have only yeah. had one and three left when you're done. Okay. Precisely. Precisely. It's clean. Now, in my example, I'm falling back to our physics code, or our Nobel laureates, because a little under the hood here, these show notes, remember I, we changed the order of things a bit, and then we ended up discovering that JQ was way cooler than I thought? Well, Mm -hmm. we're now back to the show notes I wrote sitting on the tarmac in Brussels airport at the end of (laughs) January in the snow on a three hour delay. That's when these show notes were written. (laughs) And that's how long they have been sitting in the branch called, it was called PBS 162 plus and then 163 plus and then 164 plus. (laughs) It kept on moving, right? So that's how far back these go. And at that time, I was still fascinated by Nobel Prizes. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we're back to the Nobel Prizes uh, data set. So... 
we know that if in the past, as we were working so often with our Nobel Prizes, if we wanted only the physics prizes, we would start by exploding and capturing dot prizes. So we open a square bracket, dot prizes, open a square bracket, close square bracket, pipe that to select, dot category, double equals physics, close our select, close our square bracket, and then we pipe all of that to reverse so the things are in the right bloody order. So that they you know um, they could, they're newest first and I want them oldest first. So that's how we've always done it before. Well, with map select, that becomes way simpler logic. We say dot prizes, pipe map select, dot category equals physics, pipe reverse. Huh. Isn't that easier to read? Isn't that easier to get your head around? No square brackets all over the place. It's just give me the ones that pass that category, then reverse them. Yeah. No, there there was that question mark stuff we had to do before where if it didn't exist, it gave you, does this avoid that problem? No, because there's always a category, right? If we were working with, say, the laureates array or something, we'd still have to do the question mark because sometimes there are laureates and sometimes there aren't but laureates, but there's always do, a category. So you can do that without, you can do the question mark without exploding the array. Would it be just a prizes question mark? Yeah. And then that whole okay. middle filter just gets skipped if there are no prizes. It's like, okay, okay. Well, nothing to reverse. No error. Okay. It won't give an error. It'll just go, okay, fine. <laughs> well, wait a minute. So would the entire thing not work if we'd said dot category double equals? Well, that's not going to, that wouldn't work. But anyway, I think I understand. It'll do, basically, it's a shortcut for what's above, right? So anything we could do before, we can do with map select. But it's just that we have a much shorter syntax for it. Instead of exploding and recapturing, we just do it all map select. Yeah. There's, there's, there's no actual difference in the logic. It's just, we don't waste our time exploding and recatching, we just map. And really, that is all there is to the map function. But it has a useful side effect. So, JQ doesn't like throwing errors. I know we sometimes think it does, but actually JQ goes out of its way not to throw errors. So uh, the, Not the way I write them. <laughs> <laughs> it's trying its best, I swear. I, I've never so, I, I've never written a first draft that didn't have syntax error, unexpected line end uh, at line 32. Okay, syntax errors, it can't help it, but the map function is for working with arrays. What if you throw a dictionary at it? It goes, okay. Okay. I will ignore the keys. I don't know what a key is because I'm an array function. I'll ignore the keys. And it just huh. gives you back an output of the values processed as if it was an array with just the values. So if you want to convert an array, sorry, if you want to convert a dictionary to an array, if you just map dot, it will just turn the dictionary into an array because it will just give you back the values unchanged. But wait a minute, it doesn't have... Oh, oh, so it just gets rid of, it just erases them. Okay. The keys just disappear because map has no idea what a key is. So yeah. if you start off with a dictionary of weekly sales data that's indexed, you know, mun, one amount, chew, wed, thur, fry, and you just want the numbers. I don't, yeah, I just give me an array of numbers. I can count from one to seven. If you just say map dot you will get back the array and the order will be the same order as the dictionary was. Wow, that is cool. That is a really cool little side effect. So that's just a really useful little bonus topic there. So last function, this is it. This is our final JQ function that is not bonus extras. We have map values and its job is to take a dictionary and to update the values in the key value pair. So it's just like map, but it's only going to apply to the values. And it understands, oh, dictionary, you say, right? So it understands what it is. By the way, for, for people listening uh, who aren't looking right at the notes to get it right in your head and start memorizing, it's map underscore values. Yes, it is. Okay. And let us, as an example, let us double our weekly sales. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go fix the books. Yeah. Map underscore values, open bracket, dot star two close bracket. That will simply apply dot star two to all the values in the dictionary. So Monday suddenly becomes 4,686 instead of 1,343. No, 20, 23, Yeah, yeah, whatever it said before. <laughs> Too lazy to scroll up. <laughs> so oh, that's, really, that's it's that simple. 
Have you found a reason to use that one with in anger? Um, map values, yes, because if you have data that is, say, um, it's numbers that are numbers, not numbers, that are strings, not numbers, you can map values to string, or sorry, to number. Oh, that's nice. Right. Or if you have strings that are mixed case and you really need them all lowercase, you can just ask ye upper or ASCII, ASCII up case or ASCII down case to all the values. So there are, there are actually quite a few times when that is very useful, actually. Didn't we have trouble with the Nobel Prizes? Was it the date that was a string yes. when we wanted it to be a number? And, or the vice year. Versa? The year is a string, year. therefore you That's can't do meant. math on it. Yeah. You can't do proper yeah. math on it because it's treating it as symbols instead of numbers. Right. So just like map won't throw an error if you throw a dictionary at it, map values won't throw an error if you throw an array at it because it only cares about values anyway. And an array is just values. So, oh. So it'll do, okay, fine. I'll update all your values. And it will give you back an array. So map always outputs an array. Map values outputs whatever you gave it in. So map values. Dictionary in, dictionary oh. out, array in, array out, map, array in, array out, dictionary in, array out. Okay. Now, there is one more very important and really subtle difference between map and map values. And we've hinted at it already by saying, because the select is an example that it doesn't have to be a one-to-one -one mapping, right? You can have... Each input is processed once, but if that process produces zero or a million outputs, how does the function react? Map will take them all. If you have each entry in the, in the array mapping to five million entries, well, you'll get five million entries in the output array and they'll just appear all next to each other. So where it was one value, they'll just all appear at that point in the array. And it's perfectly hmm. fine. Give me as many as you want. I'll just stick them into the output array. Uh, map values only ever takes the first one and it ignores everything else. Oh, interesting. Because yeah. it's thinking in terms of dictionaries and the concept of a single key having multiple values makes no sense. So it's in dictionary yeah. world in its head. And so it just, it's as if you piped the output through first. And it will always give you zero or one. So you can still make it go to nothingness. Mm -hmm. But you can't have more than one. You've either made it go away or you've given it one new value. But map values will so just never discard give you the other ones. Just discards oh. the other ones. And to show that, it's actually kind of difficult. So I came up with a really contrived example. <laughs> what if we take an array of arrays and we map it to the function to explode? So that will effectively flatten our arrays, right? Because the first value is the array 1, the second value is the array 2, 2, and the third value is the array 3, 3, 3. So if we map that to dot explode, the outputs through map will be 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 3. Because the first That's array becomes good, 1. Though. That's Oh, I, it is, absolutely. That, that could see useful, yeah. Yeah, I mean, what we have, we have done there is we have flattened a two-dimensional array by saying map dot explode. Now, Bart paused there, but it's 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 3. They weren't in clusters in any way. Precisely. Okay. They, they just, all the values just come out and get stuck into the output array one after the other. I could, I could see that being useful. Yeah. Now, if we try the same trick by running that through map values, which is perfectly happy to take an array, but it will still just give you the first one. So that gives us 1, 2, 3 as the output. So it's giving us the, it's... Okay, because the the first value was square bracket one. Second, the second value was square bracket two, comma two. So it still took the one. It took the two of the first two of the two twos, and it took the first three of the three threes. Three three threes. Okay. Yeah. Because hmm. it ignores everything after the first output. So like, yeah, I just wanted That's one. That's really Thank hard you. to say out loud, <laughs> isn't it? Just yeah. and. We end up with the same thing happening when we give it a dictionary to each of them. So if we give it the dictionary, A maps to the array 1, B maps to the array 2, 2, and C maps to the array 3, 3, 3, and we run those through map, we get out 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 3, 3, 
Because again, when you send it through map, you always get an array out. Even when you put a dictionary in, you always get an array out of map. Just for clarity, you added an extra three. So Did one I? comma two comma two comma three comma three comma three. Okay, <laughs> I can't count. four threes. <laughs> if we do that to map values, we get back A1, B2, C3. Yeah, yeah. So huh. subtle, but important. That last subtlety is the end of our core syllabus on JQ. Let's say wow. we have a little epilogue next time with some really cool bonus extras. But that is, we now know, frankly, we now know more of JQ than most JQ users know. There are a lot of people who use JQ for very simple things like pretty printing JSON that comes out of an API or pulling out one or two keys. Most of the people who use JQ use about 10% of what we've learned. We have learned, I estimate about two thirds, maybe three quarters of everything that there exists in JQ. Wow. But we probably know more than most of us are going to need ever. And we have covered Almost everything I've needed for doing some really quite advanced stuff with my work hat on, where I really went very, very deep down the rabbit hole. There's a reason we have the epilogue episode, because I did end up in places where I needed some even more advanced features than what we've learned. But honestly, we have learned a lot of JQ here. We are ex- All the show notes to now have you extremely well armed for handling JSON data from, well, frankly, with our web programming hat on, Outputting from APIs. That is where we see JSON all the time, right? When we wanted to find out details about our IP address, we got back a bunch of JSON. When we were doing the currencies before that API became paid for, it was a bunch of JSON that came back. When we were doing the weather, it was a bunch of JSON that came back. And so JQ I think is this perfect. Is like, I think it's like when you, uh, when you buy a new car, you see that car everywhere. I see JSON everywhere now. I mean, it, it's, it springs up I, when I was interviewing the gentleman about the, uh, the head tracking software that he had, he had written to allow him to control a computer. Uh, he had a programmer with him who was working on the code. And I was like, well, there's some JSON. It's just, yeah. it's always, ever, it's everywhere. Well, I've recently, I say recently, about two years ago at this stage, learned YAML for the first time. YAML's everywhere. Absolutely everywhere. I didn't recognize it before. YAML is everywhere. Well, yeah, you're sneaking in and on me where I don't want it. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Um, so I do have one final challenge to test what we've learned today. So we're going to start with our output of breaches for our fictitious domain. And when we get it, it's dot breaches, which is indexed by our username. And then it's just an array of strings. Well, why don't we enrich that a bit by doing a few things. So first off, let's simplify the array, the, the output by getting rid of the dot breaches and dot pastes and just going straight to the lookup table of user to what they were caught up in. So we don't instead of having to go dot breaches dot Allison, dot breaches dot Bob, dot breaches dot Joe, just dot Allison, right? Just just take that breaches, which is what we care about, and put it at the top level. So that's that's the first thing. So let, let me make sure I understand. This is uh, is this our um, our fake group of people, or are you talking yes. about the official export from Have I Been Pwned? No, the the fake group of people. Okay. So our 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 good friends Kate K W Kelly who M W Kelly and M W Kelly. Okay. Yeah. Those so at the moment, guys. M.W. Kelly just maps. <laughs> so it's, it's breaches, and then it's J.O. Sullivan, E. Green, M.W. Kelly, A. Hawkins, P. Trainer. But that breaches is just a waste of our time. And then we have the pace underneath it, which is completely empty. So top level becomes J. Sullivan, E. Green, and M.W. Kelly, etc. Right? Just that's what we care about. Stick that at the top level. Okay. All right. So that's the first transformation, which doesn't involve anything new. That's, that's stuff we've learned before. But what we want to do then to our remaining M.W. Kelly, etc., is instead of having an array of boring strings, we should have an array of dictionaries where we use the big export from the API to add some more detail into each of our elements in the array. So we, we're going to map that array of strings to become an array of dictionaries. 
see where we're going here. And what we want to do is have those strings be replaced with a dictionary indexed by, what do I say? What do I say? I've scrolled too far. Name, title, and data classes. Name, title, and data classes, right? And we're going to use the map function to do that all in one go. And then okay. I'd like you to add an extra key called your exposure mm -hmm. score, right? Your exposure core is a numeric value representing how pwned you are. And you calculate <laughs> that by looping through the breach, starting with zero. Mm -hmm. And every mm -hmm. breach you're caught up in that does not contain passwords, you get a, an exposure score of one more. And if it does contain passwords, 10 more. Oh, no. <laughs> right? So that's a reduce okay. function, right? That's, that okay. is classic reduce. Right? Take every array. With an and, or thing going on in there. Yeah, right? It's a more powerful reduce, but it's, we're reducing it. So that gives okay. us a chance to map and reduce. That sounds fun. Yeah. And that is, that is our final challenge. So, like I say, we really have done a lot of JQ, but we have a little epilogue next time for just some cool little bonus features, some of which everyone will like. Yeah, it'll just be a different subset. So, I'm so gonna this be will curious. be like this will be like the senioritis uh, thing where the the last lecture the professor gives nobody cares. You know, the final's already been turned in. You know, we're just gonna have a party, listen, and and learn some fun stuff. Pretty Can't much, and you. It's also it's actually a really good analogy because oftentimes that last lecture is the is the the professor's pet topic. Like mm. technically, it's not even on the syllabus, and I'm not allowed to ask you in the exam. But gosh darn it, I think this is cool. And so I'm going to tell you all about it in the last lecture. And the only reason you're here is because you know I'm going to give you a hint about the exam paper at the very, very end of the lecture. So you're going to sit through my pet topic all the way through. There is no exam, though. So I'll spare you that. Right. Well, that is, uh, that's all she wrote. It's all I wrote anyway. All so, right. Uh, well, this was fun, Bart. I enjoyed myself. Well, excellent. And until next time, happy computing. If you learn as much from Bart each week as I do, I'd like you to go over to lets-talk.ie and press one of the buttons over there to help support him. He does 98% of the work here. I'm just the stooge that listens to him and asks the dumb questions. If you go over to lets-talk.ie, you can support him on Patreon, you can donate via PayPal, or you can use one of his referral links. I really hope you'll go over and help him out. In the meantime, you can contact me at Podfeet or check out all of the shows we do over there over at podfeet.com. Thanks for listening and stay subscribed.